hi everyone. We're today we're going to record lecture four. Um, lecture four is kind of odd in that it is very heavy on mathematical examples, um, which means that we uh, jump back and forth. This video will actually be very short, um, and you'll have to jump over to your calculations quite often. Uh, because this is that the, the the concepts aren't difficult. What I'm going to explain to you is really kind of building from what we did last week. That um, that the examples are kind of the best way to go through this process. Um, if you're struggling with this, feel free to Google method of sections. Feel free to Google statics um, and looking at things in equilibrium. Um, you're going to find that all the kind of basic examples are very similar to the ones I've done. Um, I have looked at other lecture programs, they're all very similar, but if you want to practice with other examples, feel free. I do have a series of examples at the end of these slides for you to practice on your own, but that have worked out examples right there with them so that you can try it, but then cross check your answers or even your step by step process with the ones I've written out for you. Um, so like I said, this lecture is longer than I would have liked it to be for you guys. Um, they, I tried not to go in this in depth in past years and um, they really said, no, please give it to them, push them, make them learn this. Um, uh, so the next week will also be kind of an intense lecture, but after that, it's not gonna be so bad. Um, you're gonna see that as much as we're gonna do some in-depth calculations here, I'm not going to push you quite so hard on the assignment. So take a breath, uh, take your time. I have gone through and looked at um, the length of time people have spent on assignments versus marking. Um, Quercus is wonderful for generating um, analytic uh, statistics about people's um, uh, progress on assignments. And I can tell you that repeatedly, this isn't mean it's 100% of the time, but consistently the people who got low marks did the assignment in less than an hour or only had it open for an hour, which meant that you read it over, filled it in and clicked submit. The people that spent several days, that doesn't mean you worked on nothing but that for several days, but read it over, thought about it, maybe practiced it, tried a few more things. Those people tended to do much better. So take your time. It doesn't mean that you have to spend a lot of time on it, but maybe take, a time, take your time. Do all the answers. Let it sit for a day or two and, say, and think it through. Maybe go through and recheck your math and see if it's really how you wanted to submit it. We're gonna move on in just a second. I would like to point out that I am wearing uh, an orange shirt today. Uh, I don't know what day you watch that, uh, watch this, but it, uh, it is being filmed on September 30th, which is Orange Shirt Day, um, which is um, Every Child Matters, which is in recogni recognition of um, the injustices done by the residential schools um, uh, where children were taken from their home um, and placed into residential schools uh, of Indigenous families. Um, so this is kind of just to honor that that was a grave injustice and it is recognized throughout school systems in Canada. Sorry. slide. Yeah. Okay, so we're still recording. That was, I clicked the wrong button. All right. So to do the work we're about to do um, uh, in all of the examples that you're going to see, we need to talk about how we reference internal forces in elements. Because right now we've talked about things overall. We've looked a little bit about things internally, but we need to know how we draw things. If we are talking about this point right here, and we want to talk about what's happening in these two members, if we draw an arrow away from the point, we're saying that it's intention. If we draw an arrow towards the point, we're saying it's in compression. If we don't know if it's in tension or compression, we will make a guess and solve to see what the answer is. I always draw things in tension, and you will see in the calculations why that is so important. 
it means that if we get a negative number, it tells you that you drew your arrow wrong. So that means for me, if I always draw everything in tension, a negative value always means it's in compression. If I switch back and forth between sometimes drawing in compression and sometimes drawing in tension, if I get a negative value, I have to go back and check and see how I drew my arrow originally. I like to keep things with a simple linear process. So if I always draw everything in tension, if I get a negative number, it means my answer is in compression. If I'm talking about what happens right here in a member, so if I cut a member right here, for example, or I'm talking about that node right there in the element, if I draw the arrow towards it, still it's in compression. If I draw the arrow away, it's in tension. A lot of engineers get really worked up about method of sections and method of joints. They are the exact same thing. It's just method of joints, and we're gonna see that in a few minutes. This is because some of you are super keen and have probably read ahead and are wondering why I never talk about method of joints. It's because that is a red herring. They are the exact same thing. It's just that method of joints is a method of section that doesn't have any forces that can cause it to spin. So we're looking at a really tiny section or a section that you might just call a joint. Um, I've even had other engineers say, you haven't included method of joints in this. And in fact, in one of the accreditation things, one of the engineers on the review panel brought that up and I had to explain to him that it's the exact same thing. And he agreed that yes, it was. And so why would I muddy the waters? Method of sections, method of joints, exact same thing. So you guys are gonna go switch to um, example one, uh, part one uh, videos, where we are going to take this truss right here and use something called method of sections to solve for some internal forces. I, th I used to have, oh no, okay. In a few slides, you're gonna do that. If we have this truss right here, we'd wanna solve for these reactions. That we learned how to do last week, no problem. We can uh, solve for our reactions, which you will see in that example video as well. But we wanna know what's happening to all of these internal members. Remember, we, our whole goal is that we wanna find out what structural members we need in here to resist the load. Because this 100 kilonewtons is getting over here and over here somehow, and it's moving through that truss in some way. Well, we can see that some of it's gonna go here and some of it's gonna go here. Um, that's trying to make the bottom cord do this and the top cord do this. So we know something is happening in these members and we need to know what those forces are so that we can make sure we can find the members with the reduced capacity greater than the factored loads. So once we solve for these reactions, we need to do something called method of sections. Method of sections is based on the premise that if something is in equilibrium and we've proven that it's in equilibrium, and this is in equilibrium because it can't go up and down, it can't go side to side, and it can't spin about every point. And we know that because we found what reactions it takes to make sure that doesn't happen. So this free body diagram is something in equilibrium because we calculated that. So if all of it is in equilibrium, a part of it is in equilibrium. That doesn't mean that there's not some small internal movement. That's not what we're talking about. What we're saying is, is if we pretended to cut a section of this up and look at it on its own, we're not saying the rest doesn't exist. We're saying we're just gonna draw part of it at a time. We're saying that that bit can't fly up and down in space, back and forth in space, or spin around. So this overall object can't spin all the way around and move up and down and move side to side. So let's do that. Let's pick a spot and cut this. We know the overall thing is in equilibrium because we calculated that. So we've cut it and we know that for this to not be moving around, there's some applied load here. It's the reaction that was dependent on our 100 kilonewtons. So this reaction isn't ignoring the fact that 100 kilonewtons is over here because it was solved and dependent on that 100 kilonewtons. 
But what we really want to know is what's happening to these three members that we cut through. Let's call them A, B, and C. Something's happening to them, their intention or compression, but we don't know what, which one, or how much. I always draw everything in tension. So remember, at that point there, it means my arrow's going away if it's in tension. At that point there, my arrow's going away if it's in tension. At that point there, same thing. Arrow's going away if it's in tension. So I've drawn A, B, and C in tension. I don't know if that's true, but if I get a negative value, I'll know that my tension guess was wrong and this thing is really in compression. So now is a good time to jump over to the example video where you will see me go through solving this because you can see that this B can be broken down into BY and BX. So all of this worked out solution is here um, and you can see that done out step by step verbally and written out in the examples part one. In example part two, you will be able to go through that exact same process with this frame. A frame is essentially a truss. So this would be a lateral load resisting system in a building. Don't worry, we're going to spend time talking about that later. But instead of being a truss, which is in bending, this is a frame that's trying to rack like this. And we have some lateral load pushing on this frame in our building. And so, again, the first thing we would do is solve for our reactions. And then we'd start taking a series of section cuts and solving for the internal forces. All right, this is where I really want you guys to see um, about diagrams or how we might visually represent the forces that we find in things. And the first one is an axial force diagram. If we have this column here that has 200 kilonewtons applied at the top, we know that we must have a 200 kilonewton reaction holding it up at the bottom. That means that right here on this column, there's 200 kilonewtons. Right here on this column, there's 200 kilonewtons. Right here on this column, there's 200 kilonewtons. So anywhere along the length of this column, it is seeing 200 kilonewtons of compressive force. We will often draw a visual diagram of that for ourselves. So you can see here that this column has anywhere along its length 200 kilonewtons of axial force in it doesn't seem like it gives us that much information for this single column, but watch where it comes in really handy. If you look at this, you can see that 200 kilonewtons is applied here and nothing else really happens to it until this point right here. At this point right here, it's still seeing this 200 kilonewtons, but now it's also seeing 300 kilonewtons. So in this zone of the column, it's actually experiencing 500 kilonewtons. Because again, our reaction would be showing 500 kilonewton reaction here. So if we drew our axial force diagram, all of a sudden it starts to be a handy little picture. We can see at a glance that we've got 200 kilonewtons here and 500 kilonewtons in the column here. It might make it a little bit easier at a glance to see what our internal forces are and let us start our design process. If we had done method of sections, if we had solved for reactions, we would have gotten 500 kilonewtons here. If we had cut here and only kept the bottom, we would have needed to draw an internal force here. If we summed the forces, that would have had to be 500. If we cut it here and kept the top half and we put an unknown force here, we would have solved it and found that we had 200 plus 300 needed to be balanced by 500 kilonewtons in the other direction. If we cut it right here and kept the top, we would need an internal force of 200. If we cut it right here and kept the bottom, we would have 500 kilonewtons upwards, 300 kilonewtons downwards, leaving us with 200 kilonewtons of internal force. So method of sections would still work for this process, 
we're essentially drawing out a graphic of the internal forces we would have calculated. Let's draw the internal force diagram or the axial force diagram in our case for this for the top and bottom cords of the truss that we calculated. Well, we had found that these two cords had zero axial force in them. These two had 16.7 and 50 kilonewtons of axial force and tension. We had 16.7 kilonewtons of compression in this member. These two both had 33.3 kilonewtons of compression. And this member here had 50 kilonewtons of compression. If we were making all of these members the same size at the top, we'd say, okay, here's our governing load. We've got 50 kilonewtons in this portion of it. We should make sure we have a member that has a reduced capacity greater than the factored 50 kilonewtons of compressive load. And the same thing with this bottom member. So this graphic really helps us see that quickly. Let's draw our axial force diagram on our frame. This is just a nice little handy one that lets us see quite quickly that this is in tension, these two are in compression, and we actually have no load in that column right there. So let's talk through what's happening in uh, a truss and compare it to what might be happening as a member on its own. A truss is really one big member in bending. And we've got a series of struts in between that is transferring the load from the top to the bottom. And actually, I'm going to grab this normal like a pain to lug this around on the train. But I have my handy foam beam block. So you can see here, I have a line down the middle. That's the center of my beam. And when I apply a load on it like this, you can see that the top squashes and the bottom stretches out. So something's happening there. That top looks like it's in compression and that bottom looks like it's in tension. Well, when we actually solved those trusses, we saw that we had a compressive load at the top and a tension force in the bottom. Well, that seems to check out with what we see in this bending member. We also had our strut or our uh, bracing element in here that had a force at a diagonal. But we know that we can redraw this force as if it was its X and Y components. So we can draw that as X and Y components. Well, we also know that this is really passing through this line right here and if we have both of these going in the same direction, in the same plane, we might as well just draw them together. We're really saying that the internal forces along this cut line overall, not in the individual elements, but if we were cutting right here at this spot, is the same as a compressive force at the top, a tension force at the bottom, and some up and down force right along that plane. Well, if we wanted to redraw this, let's, let's stop looking at all of the internal bits on this bending element and say it's one big giant bending element. So we're masking all of those internal elements and now we've just got one bending element. We've got the same thing happening here. Well, what happens when we have two equal and opposite forces? When we have two equal and opposite forces with some distance between them, so there's some eccentricity between them, they're canceling out each other's movement, but they are causing rotation in the same direction, we know that these two equivalent forces in opposite directions is often called an equivalent force couple, and it can also be drawn as a moment. So, we can look at this and say our truss that had our internal forces in each member is very similar to a beam in bending that has some up and down force on this plane and some bending force about this point right here. Well, 
We've seen that shear is talking about what's happening along a cut plane. This is our cut plane, and this is the internal shear in this bending element, that the rest of it is over here, that is required to make sure this bit doesn't fly off into space. And this internal moment is what's required to make sure the whole part doesn't spin off in space. So remember, this reaction is dependent on the loads and there's some reaction over here. And then we have these internal forces that's keeping this portion or this section of our member from moving in space or spinning in space. So remember bending. It's a force that acts to bend a component, putting one side of the part in tension and the opposite side in compression. Often we have gravity loads, so we often tend to think about bending in this direction, but we can have upward loads that makes things bend like this instead if we want. So what we're really saying is that at any given part, we have, if we were making our cut right here, we're looking at these two forces, but there's something happening on the other side over here. So now you're going to go to your example problems um, and we're gonna, you're gonna work through doing this beam that has a point load coming down on it. So point load coming down, the mid, mid span of the beam, <laughs> causing this thing to bend. <laughs> this has been sitting in my cupboard for a while. So it's causing it to bend. So we know that there must be a reaction holding it in place and that there, we're making a cut somewhere along, we'll make a cut somewhere along its length to determine internal forces. Where? We don't know. We want to find the worst case internal load. So maybe we need to make a sequence of cuts. So feel free to go check that out now. Um, that's continued in uh, uh, part two. So here it is fully worked out if you want to go back and take your time or check it, check yourself out on it. The next part in that example, uh, part two, is doing the exact same member but with placeholders for our force and our length. If we see this member being designed again and again and again with different lengths and different point loads, maybe we can start to develop a shorthand that makes it a little bit easier for us. So you can see that worked out right here. One of the things that is going to come in handy in the next little part of uh, doing these, these problems is understanding what an analogous point load is. An analogous point load is when we have a uniform force or some, air, some um, distributed force um, that we want to represent as a single force. So if I, <coughs> if I laid out evenly across a table, my entire load would be distributed across that table. But what we're saying is, is that's very similar at least to the reactions and only the reactions. It is this, so you know half of my load is going to one side and half of my load is going to the other side. That is the same thing as if I stood up and stood in the middle of the table. Half of my load is going to one end and half of my load is going to the other. We don't know what's happening with the rest of that, though. We're not saying that that analogous point load, which is the, me laying out flat, but instead turning up and standing on the middle of the table, is not going to cause the same situation internally. But we can use the analogous point load to represent what's happening at the ends. So it's handy in finding our reactions, or after we make a cut, using a new analogous point load to help us see what happens at the ends of our cut. So if we had this right here and we wanted to find out the reactions, we could redraw this as if it was the force, the entirety of this force acting at the middle of that uniformly distributed load. It's not at the middle of the beam, it's at the centroid of what that distributed load was. And its value is W times the length that it occurred over. 
and it would happen at halfway along the length of the lobe, not of the overall beam. It gets more interesting in triangles. If you guys remember anything about triangles, you know that the centroid of the triangle is at the two-thirds, one-third mark. This is something that I expect you guys to remember either from junior high or high school. Um, I'm not going to spend any time explaining why it's at the two-third mark and one-third mark. You can go back and look up kind of basic geometry if you want to look up that. But its centroid is right here at the one-third mark of the triangle and the two-third mark of the triangle. So we also remember that the area of a triangle is its base times its height divided by two. So the base times the height would give us that entire rectangle, and we only want half of it, so we divide it by two, and then it's the same as if it was happening at the one, two-third, one-third mark of this triangle. So two-third, one-third mark of the triangle, but the triangle didn't start until it was D1 over. So the analogous point load for this triangularly distributed line load on a beam that's placed at some portion upon the length of the beam is the same as the analogous point load P, which would be W times D2 divided by two, W being our height and D2 being our length, and then dividing it by two because it's not the full rectangle. And then it's at the one third, two third mark of our triangle or one third or two thirds of D2 plus this portion of D1 right here. So now you're gonna take that understanding of an analogous point load and you're gonna solve this uniformly distributed load beam that has a uniformly distributed load of W and an unknown length of L. And the first thing we're gonna do is solve for our reactions and then we're gonna do method of sections. And for both of those, we're gonna need analogous point loads to find the end conditions of each one of those free body diagrams. Um, and with that, maybe we can develop something that lets us know what the maximum shear, the maximum moment, and what the reactions are for this type of beam no matter what the W is and no matter what the L is. The reason that's so handy is because this is the single most common beam we design. It's probably 95% of the beams we design. And you're gonna see that we develop some equations at the end of this. Every engineer can recite that equation in their sleep because they punch it into their calculator all the time. So those are all worked out. Here's that problem fully worked out. Um, I expect now that you've gone and looked at that example, we summed it up by saying that we calculated that for a uniformly distributed load on an unknown length beam, the reactions are WL divided by two, or the uniformly distributed load times the length divided by two. So half of the load goes to this side, and half of the load goes to this side. We calculated that anywhere along its length, V is WL divided by two minus WX, and its moment is WLX divided by two minus WX squared divided by two. But we don't often care about everywhere along the beam. What we, re what we really wanna know is the worst cases on the beam. And V max happened at the ends, and it was WL divided by two, huh, exact same as our reactions. And our moment was WL squared divided by eight kilonewton meters. And that happened at the midpoint of the beam. You can see that when I bend this, the spot that's seeing the worst case things happening is right here at this midpoint. So that kind of checks out with what we would intuitively know. If this is the most common type of beam we have to calculate, these are two of the most common equations we would plug into our calculator again and again and again. Shear is WL divided by two, and our max moment is WL squared divided by eight, again and again and again. If these are things that we calculate again and again and again, maybe there are little tables that draw out everything that I just made you guys calculate. 
So we have our uniformly distributed load here. Look at this beautiful thing. It looks exactly like what we just spent 20 minutes calculating out ourselves. You can see here that our reaction equals our shear equals our WL divided by two, exactly what we calculated. They do give you V at anywhere along X. We had WL divided by two minus WX. They just pulled the W out, same equation. We had, w, we had M max at the center as WL squared divided by eight, exact same thing that they calculated. And we had mx, or the moment at any x along its length, we had wlx divided by 2 minus wx squared divided by 2. They've just pulled the wx divided by 2 outside of the brackets. Exact same thing. Don't worry about deflection right now. We will come back to that next week. We're going to come back and talk about this moment and explicitly the moment at the center of the beam. Look, here's the other one we calculated out by hand. Um, they have uh, the maximum moment. We had, P, we had one quarter PL, or PL divided by four, and we had a reaction equals our shear of one half P. So again, exact same things we calculated. If we could do it for those ones, we know now we could do it for any other ones, but maybe I'm not going to be so mean and make you do a whole bunch more. You can. I've given you examples. If it helps you do more problems, go do those other examples. You'll really benefit from them. But people have also gone through and calculated these for us. These ones are a bit of a pain. Do you see they use this capital W? Well, capital W is referring to the analogous point load. They're saying they've already calculated what that entire load is. So instead of the lowercase w, which means it's the uniformly distributed load, they're using a capital W, which is talking about the analogous point load. And that's the same for both of these. They're both triangles. So if you ignore its location, they're both going to be the same value, or w times the length divided by two. You can see though, that the analogous point load is just helpful for determining um, uh, uh, our bits. What's happening internally looks very different. Here are a few more uh, examples of beam loading diagrams. In the downloads, there is a series of beam loading diagrams. Go check them out. There's a bunch of these that you can go reference. If you find it helpful on those examples that I've given you, Compare it to a beam loading diagram, then go through the calculations and see if you get the answer you expect. If you have um, a bunch of different loading conditions in one, it might start to get a little bit harder. You can do two things. You can do method of sections, which I've just shown you. Do it everywhere you get a major change. So if you have a reaction, do it uh, between the reaction and the next point load as a placeholder. If you have a uniformly distributed load, do it anywhere along its length until you hit a point load or another reaction. Um, or you can do something called superpositioning. You can find what the value is using these bot diagrams for each of the two parts. So if you had a uniformly distributed load and a point load, you can find the maximum moment um, or you can find the moment at a particular point for both of them and sum them up. But remember, they, if depending on where that point load is, the worst case moment might not be in the same spot. So you'll need to check the moment for each type at each worst case and sum up those, and whichever one is the biggest one would be the total. Again, I think it's probably easier to do method of sections. That's up to you. Uh, Superpositioning um, is a concept that appears in most disciplines. Um, uh, but it's basically saying you can break it down into two parts, do the two parts easily, and then sum them up. You just have to remember that uh, you can see that for this one here, if you had this load and this load both happening on a beam, the maximum moment for this one is right here, and the maximum moment for this one is right here. So adding those two up in that, those two maximums might give you a higher moment than you need.
So the takeaway tips, again, the lecture video is really short on this because there's a lot in the uh, examples, the worked out examples. If we know the forces, we can use the free body diagram to calculate the reactions. If we know the forces and the reactions, we can use the free body diagram of a part, that's really saying method of sections, to calculate the internal forces that must be there for that to remain static. Method of sections we can do for trusses, we can do it for beams. We know that we can draw axial force diagrams. You're gonna see in the examples that we go through and draw diagrams along a member's length for its shear and for its moment. And so now we know that we can draw an axial force diagram, a shear force diagram, and a bending moment diagram that allows us to, at a glance, see what is happening internally to our member. With that, we can see what the worst case reactions are, we can see what the worst case shear is, we can see what the worst case moment is, and if it's a truss, we can see what the worst case axial forces for each member are. With that, we should now be able to go on and start looking at the other side of our equation uh, to see what the reduced capacity is. So we now have our worst case shear, reactions, moments, and axial forces. If we started out with a factor load or with a sub F, that means all of these things we've just calculated are the factored values. So if the force was factored, our shear is factored, our moment is factored, our reactions are factored, or we have our worst case factored condition. And now we can set about seeing if that is less than the reduced capacity of the actual member that we have. So feel free now to go ahead and look at a few examples. You can do these on your own. If you think this is easy for you, don't worry about it. Check these out. Uh, you don't have to check these out. Um, if you find that more examples is what helps you learn, go through, do those examples. They all have worked out um, handwritten examples here for you. You might find that really handy. This one's interesting because it's got a uniformly distributed load along a portion of its length and then it's got a point load. Um, if you like even more examples than what I've given you, you can go to the internet and check things out. You can search method of sections, uh, you can search statics, static equilibrium. Um, just remember though that most of the textbooks and most things you're gonna find are gonna be from the states and those are all done in imperial calculations. Um, there isn't many Canadian examples, and when I've talked to the other professors around Canada who teach these courses, they all make up their own um, example problems as well. If not, they spend a lot of time, or a lot of wasted time, not on the principles, but on doing conversions between imperial and metric. And I think that is not the point of this course. Um, I'm going to trust that you can make a conversion between feet and inches, uh, or between feet to inches to millimeters or possibly to meters. Um, that's not what we want to talk about here. So I don't want to waste time or too much time on that conversion process for the really difficult math. Um, we will do that on some of the easier math problems we're going to do later in the term, but this is the really hard one and I want to give you the opportunity to not have to worry about conversions on top of it. But if you need more, feel free to go check it out. Just remember to be aware of units. So have a good week and uh, we'll start talking about stress and strain next week.